And uh, anyway, it's great to be back with you guys. Uh, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day. It's a day you've made. We rejoice and we're glad in it. Thank you that you're with us. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you're for us. Thank you for being a good dad and giving us your only begotten son to be our Lord and Savior, to remove your wrath from us, to make us more like you, to make us your kids. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for taking flesh. Thank you for sympathizing with our every weakness. Thank you for taking the cross and thank you for raising from the dead. Thank you, God, for sending your Holy Spirit to make us more like Jesus. As we sang this morning, the same power that lives in us is the same power that rose Jesus from the dead. And we are so thankful that we can rely on you for great things to advance your kingdom. Holy Spirit, we welcome you here. We're thankful for the fruit, for the gifts that you've given us. And Lord, we thank you for your church. We thank you for your word. Your word is truth. It is a light into our path. Please sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth and scripture cannot be broken. The words of the Lord are pure words. The silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Thank you, God, for your word. Help us to daily, constantly meditate on your word that we might not sin against you. We love you, Jesus. Thank you again for this time that we have. We give it to you for your glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, I don't know how many of you have been watching the news, but this past week, the House passed a bill to codify gay marriage. It had the support of just not even about 25% of the Republican Party. And I'm sad to say that all four of our representatives up in Utah voted in favor of that gay marriage bill. You've heard about Roe versus Wade being overturned, not uh, just the end of June. And since our government is controlled in all of its houses by the Democrats, the Democrats are worried about the same thing that happened to Roe versus Wade is going to happen to gay marriage. So they moved to codify gay marriage and ensure that that would be the law of the land. Well, the question that has been lost in the shuffle here this past week is, what is marriage? All right? Let me give you something else to think about. Earlier this year, we had Judge Katanji Brown Jackson sit before the Senate Supreme Court on the Supreme Court hearing. And she was asked by Tennessee Senator Marsha Blackburn, what is what? A woman. Well, you would think that Judge Brown Jackson would be very qualified to answer that question. I mean, after all, she is a woman. And she has to deal with all these laws that deal with women, in particularly the law that has to do with women's reproductive rights. Right? Um, we had this past year, I don't know if you are familiar with Matt Walsh. He's a political commentator. He came out with a film called, What is a Woman? Well, that's a very important question to be asking these days. But for our purposes, we want to get into a much more basic question. And that is, 
what is God? <laughs> and I have to deal with this in my ministry all the time. What is God? We got all these definitions of what God is. Now, should we, as believers, punt on that question and simply say, like Judge Brown Jackson did, well, I'm not a biologist. I can't answer that question. Should we say, well, I'm not a theologian, so I really can't answer that question about what is God. I mean, is God merely a personal definition? Is it subjective? That is, is its truth dependent on what you believe? I mean, you have your definition of God. I have my definition of God. Is that all that can be said about the matter? Well, the Bible gives us what I take to be an objective de definition of God. God has a particular nature to him. And he has particular pronouns that are used of him. I mean, is God of the Bible? Is he an it? Is he a she? Is he a he? Is he a they? So, of course, there are different traditions that have different understandings of who God is. But the Bible is clear in Romans chapter 1 that God has made it plain, his knowledge to everyone who has their faculties functioning properly so that men are without excuse. But because they know God and they don't love God, they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So we're going to look at some definitions of God and how people do that in various tr traditions today. I think it's very important that we are aware of these different definitions of God because the false prophets are here. And you need to be aware of that. Jesus was asked the question, what is the greatest commandment? And he replied in Matthew 22, 37, by saying that it is to love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. Well, how can you truly love someone if you don't know who it is you're loving? I could say I love my wife, Tara, but if I turn around and tell you, yeah, Tara is a fish taco. Yeah, that would be appropriate to laugh <laughs> because it would be indicative of me not knowing what Tara really is, you know, say. The same applies to the God of all reality. We can have all different sorts of definitions of him, and we say that we love him. But if we have a definition of God that is completely different from the God of the Bible, then it should be obvious that we do not know the God of the Bible. Are you following me? Okay. Jesus said this in John chapter 8, verse 24. He said, unless you believe that I am, that is the God who appeared to Moses in the Old Testament, you will die in your sin. The Jews got really upset when he said that unless you believe that I am. 
And he, they said, you, you said that you, Moses, saw you? Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am the eternal God. The Jews got the point. Jesus was claiming to be God. He also taught in John chapter 17, verse 3. He said, here is eternal life that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus whom you have sent. The late Bible answer man, Walter Martin, are you guys familiar with him? He was Hank Hennegraff's predecessor. He made this statement that goes like this. He said, you can be right in every area of doctrine. But if you are wrong on who God is, you are wrong enough to lose your soul for eternity. Let me say that to you again. You can be right in every area of doctrine. But if you are wrong on who God is, you are wrong enough to lose your soul for eternity. That is how important it is that you know God. Now, so the doctrine of God is critically important. Is it everything? No, of course not. But it's certainly something. And our churches these days don't seem to be very concerned about that. Yet Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.16, he said to watch your life and your doctrine carefully. In our churches today, we do a great job with the former. Not so much with the latter. So it's important that we spend some time talking about the latter, about the doctrine of God. And what happens when you don't know what the Bible teaches about God? Well, you're easy prey for the cults. You're easy prey for false prophets. You're easy prey for Satan who roams around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. As it says in 1 Peter 5.8, Jesus himself warned of false prophets and false Christ that would come the last days in Matthew 24, 24. The Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 20, he said he told the church that after his departure, that savage wolves would come in and would not spare the flock. And he warned the church for a period of three years that these guys were coming. And he warned them to the point of tears. Did you hear that? That is how passionate the Apostle Paul was about false teachers, false prophets coming in to destroy the church. Yet we hardly hear any of this today in our churches. Why? Well, I suggest it's because they're here. <laughs> they're in our churches. We have the wheat and the tares Jesus talked about. They are here today. And we have become so accustomed to that that we don't want to upset anybody. Right? The church today is suffering from what the late Dr. Walter Martin used to call a, a very prevalent disease. And it goes by its Latin name, non rockabotus Oh, that is so true. We do not want to rock the boat these days. We don't want to upset people. We want people to be a part 
of us and what we're doing. And hopefully one day they'll be able to hear the gospel, which is all true. We need to be able to speak the truth and love to people. But we need to beware that false teaching by false prophets is not to be tolerated in the church. The Apostle Paul said that it was our practice in Colossians 1 to warn everyone. What a goal. Think about that for a moment. His goal was to admonish, to warn everyone with all wisdom. Do you hear that? True love warns. And it's either indifference or it's just hate that allows people to drive off a bridge that's out without warning them. So we need to be aware of what the false prophets, the false teachers are teaching. And we need to be able to confront that and answer that in all wisdom, in all gentleness and respect. First Peter chapter 3, verse 15, the very famous apologetics verse. Apologetics is simply a defense of the faith. And it says to be ready always to give to everyone who asks of you a reason for the hope that you have, an answer to everyone, but do it with gentleness and respect. So it is critical that we be prepared. So let's talk about some various definitions of God. This is going to be a little different today. I'm, I'm more of a teacher than I am a pastor, so I hope you bear with me. But I would like to talk to you about some basic definitions. Let's talk first of all about pantheism. This is pan, which means all theism means God. It is the belief that all is God. Into the shade, okay? Sure. How's that? Okay, great. Okay, this is also East, this is basic Hinduism. This is Eastern thought, Eastern philosophy. That's phi in Greek, so don't get freaked out about that. Phi, Eastern philosophy. Uh, New Age. What do we mean by New Age? New Age is basically an old lie. One of my professors at Talbot uh, Henry Holloman used to call it ancient heresies dressed up in spacesuits. All right. So it is basically the repackaging of ancient Hinduism into modern lingo, into Christian lingo. You hear that? Okay. So this is basically the belief that all is God, but it is also polytheistic. Poly means many. Theist, we already discussed what that is. God, so it's many gods. You have various manifestations of the all. Everything is God but you have particular individuals that have he or she pronouns that show up to manifest the all. Now you also have JWs. I'm sure you're a lot more familiar with these guys. As a matter of fact, my wife and I 
<laughs> had an encounter with them Thursday at the Oceanside Harbor. They are uh, required to do their pioneering work, it's called, in which they go out and basically evangelize. But their version of evangelism is they set up a little display of Jehovah Witness books, and they just sit there while everybody else passes by. Well, of course, I had to confront them. Sure. Yeah. And so I went up to them and I told them that I would like for them to check out my website. Some of you may be interested in that. It's called jwinfo.org. And it has to deal with how the Jehovah Witnesses have devalued Christ. They've devalued Jesus. Well, all of a sudden, she was upset about that and said, we don't devalue Christ at all. We believe he is the Savior. He died for us. And we believe like you in that respect. I said, well, actually, you believe that he is a God. A God. No, we don't believe that. She was being very deceptive. I said, of course you do. Your own translation in the New World Translation says, and I quote this to you, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Well, she knew that I knew what I was talking about. And all of a sudden, she was, well, I don't want to argue. And so I started pressing her some more on who the creator is. And what a lousy translation, the New World Translation is, that doesn't have the backing of any Hebrew or Greek scholars. Well, we only had about five minutes with her and uh, probably her younger brother. And they picked up the display and walked to the car that was right there and put it in. And I snapped a picture of them leaving and warned them again, but they took off. And the last time I had an interaction with Jehovah Witnesses was probably a year ago, maybe two, outside of our public library. I, had, I did have a little longer with them at the public library, but same result. They ended up leaving, just picking up and, and leaving. So it's very difficult dealing with Jehovah Witnesses once they find out that you know what you're talking about. But anyway, their view of God is what we may call Unitarian. And a Unitarian view of God basically is that there's only one God and one person. And in the Jehovah Witness case, that person has the preferred pronoun of a he. Whereas Unitarian Universalists usually have the preferred pronouns of he or she for God. Now this God, Jehovah Witnesses believe, is Jehovah. And Jehovah has his first and greatest creation, who is who? Jesus, who later became Jesus, but actually that creation was Michael the Archangel. Michael the Archangel, first and greatest creation of Jehovah God, who showed up as Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus died on a torture stake, not a cross, and 
was risen from the dead, not bodily, but as an invisible spirit creature. Okay. Quite like he was before he came to earth as Michael the Archangel. And then he came back in 1914 to start working through the Watchtower headquarters. Invisibly. And the Holy Spirit Holy Spirit has pronoun, and his pronoun is an it. Because the Holy Spirit is not a person. It is God's impersonal active force. All right, so that's Jehovah Witnesses. Now, there's this other view I want to talk to you about which is called modalism. This is an ancient heresy, modalism. Modalism is also Unitarian. But it's Unitarian of a sort. It's Unitarian that believes that the names of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are simply that, names. Look, I am a father. I am also a son. I am also a spirit with flesh and bones. Okay. I have a body. So, I am one person that has different titles. Do you see that? So, modalism teaches that there's one God and one person, but, the ty but this one person has different titles. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it just depends on how you are looking at God, how he appears to you. But what is at rock bottom is he's still a Unitarian God in which he is one God and one person. Now, let's talk about what we are very familiar with because we are missionaries in Utah to the Mormons. Let's talk about Mormonism. Mormonism is not Unitarian. It's polytheistic. We talked about polytheism under Hinduism. Mormonism is not pantheistic, but it is polytheistic. It is, when it comes to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it is tri-theistic. There are three gods, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, there are an, an infinite amount of gods out there for other worlds. We have, Mormons believe, in one God for us. One God for us. And that one God for us is a oneness of purpose. Look, we are all one in purpose here today in coming to church to fellowship and worship our God. We are not one being. We are one in the nature that we share. We're not dogs and cats and humans and trees. We are all humans here who are one in our purpose, 
but we are quite different as separate human beings. Okay? So in Mormonism, you have God who is a man who had to grow up to become a God by following some other God before him. There is a very famous statement given by one of their prophets. It was actually before, long before he became a prophet. It's called the Lorenzo Snow Couplet. It's a two-line saying, and it goes like this. And most Mormons have heard this. It says, as man is, God once was. As God is, man may be. Let me say that to you again. Listen very carefully. As man is, God once was. As God is, now man may be. So, God was like us at one point. For all we know, he could have been a sinner. He could have been a homosexual. He could have been a rapist. He could have been a child molester. He could have been a drug addict. He could have been all sorts of things because he was a man like us who had all sorts of temptations that he had to overcome and become exalted for being a God for the world that he creates. Okay. So he creates a world after he becomes a God through his wife or wives, I should say, probably wives. Tara's mom is LDS and she will tell you that it just makes sense by looking at the billions of people that have lived on this earth that God probably had more than one wife, probably has a number of wives that he populates this world with. See, because we are all literal children of heavenly parents. And since we share the same nature, like begets like, we too can grow up to become gods just as our parents did before us so that we can go and populate a world somewhere and have our own children worship who? Us. And we will be the only God for them that they are concerned about. So this is actually a certain type of polytheism. It's actually called he know theism. He know means one theism, but in this context, there is only one God for us. And that God can either be a, an individual human, the Father, or it can be referring to a team or an office of exalted beings. In our case, we have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who are all men who became exalted to ruling over us as one God in purpose. I hope that's clear. Now, what I want to do is I want to contrast all that with what we believe as Christians. And Christians are Trinitarian. We believe that the Bible speaks of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as one God in purpose. in nature,
And the type of nature that he has is the creator. Now this is very important, creator here. Because in Mormonism, God turns out to be a creature. There's a fundamental difference that Trinitarians are non-negotiable about. And that is the creator versus the creature. In Mormonism, God is a creature who had a father before him that he had to bow down and submit to, and he had to use the elements, matter, to obtain to his divine status. So the God of Mormonism is better described as an organizer. Hmm? He takes the eternal matter that is there and he organizes it to make a world conducive for us to live in so that we can grow up and become gods ourselves. The Trinitarian God, on the other hand, is the creator of literally everything outside himself. Nothing exists except by him. And he is the creator and sustainer of all that is. Now, I, we, we need to get clear on this, that Trinitarianism does agree with Mormonism and modalism in certain aspects. Trinitarianism agrees with Mormonism in not being Unitarian because there are three persons in the Godhead that are actually distinct persons or centers of consciousness in God. Yet Trinitarianism agrees with modalism. How? Because it's not polytheistic. There is only one true God and all others are false gods. Now Trinitarianism disagrees with Mormonism since the members of God for Trinitarianism are inseparable. This is a very important term that you've got to understand. You've got to keep this in mind when you're dealing with false prophets. The members of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are inseparable. They're not really separate. They're inseparable, but they're also distinct. They're distinct because the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Holy Spirit. They have a reality that is distinct from one another. But they are inseparable. How? I like to use the illustration of the triangle. In a triangle, if you're going to have a triangle, you've got at least two different things going on here. Two distinct things. You have the sides of a triangle and you have the angles of a triangle. Angles are not sides. You understand that? They're different. They're distinct from one another. But if you're going to have a triangle, you have got to have angles and you've got to have sides. They always hook up, as it were. 
Well, the same goes for the Trinitarian God. If you're going to have God, you have got to have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we disagree with Mormonism because we don't believe that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are separate human beings like all of us are here. They are inseparable. And they've always been the only God there is. Now we also disagree with modalism. Because the names, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, refer to distinct persons and not different ways of describing the same person. All right, now I'm going to finish this up here real quickly. How much time do we have, by the way? All day. Okay, well, I, I hope this is beneficial for you guys. I really do. This is really important stuff we're dealing with here. But I am going to finish this up real quickly by going through a quick Bible study on what the God of the Bible is. And the first thing we want to look at is we want to look at there being only one God who created everything. That is basic for Trinitarianism. If you're going to start talking about the Trinity, you need to start out by talking about there being only one God who created everything. Genesis 1.1 says what? In the beginning was the word. Excuse me, I'm going to John 1. God created everything in the beginning. Psalms 96 verses 4 and 5. If you have a Bible, we should look these up. Psalms 96. According to Wikipedia. Psalms 96, verse 4. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Do you see the contrast there? The Bible does speak of gods. But it is very clear that the gods that the Bible talks about are idols. And they are quite different from the God who created the heavens. The heavens and the earth, as Genesis 1.1 says. Let's go over to Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah 43. According to Wikipedia. Isaiah 43, verse 10 says, You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am He. Before me, there was no God formed, nor will there be after me. Before God, after God, he's it. As a matter of fact, go to the next chapter. Isaiah 44, verse 6 says, This is what the Lord says, Israel's king and redeemer, the Lord Almighty. I am the first. I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. Go down to verse 8. Do not tremble. Do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim this and foretell it long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? No. There is no other rock. I know not any. You believe God is omniscient. Right? He knows all true propositions. This seems to indicate that in all God's infinite knowledge, he doesn't know of any other God. 
Go down to verse 24. This is what the Lord says. Your Redeemer who formed you in the womb. I am the Lord, the maker of all things, who stretch out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself. God does the creation work of the heavens and the earth alone. He does it by himself. This is an interesting passage that I just came across like a month or two ago in Jeremiah chapter 51 because it is so exhaustive of what God creates. And it, I just, it, it surprised me that it, I never noticed this before. Jeremiah chapter 51. We're going to read verses 14 through 19. The Lord of hosts has sworn by himself, saying, Surely I will fill thee with men as caterpillars, and they shall lift up a shout against thee. He made the earth by his power. He established the world by his wisdom and hath stretched out the heaven by his understanding. The earth, the world, the heaven. It seems pretty exhaustive. Let's go on. When he uttereth his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens, and he causeth the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth, and he maketh lightnings with rain and bringeth forth the wind out of his treasures. Every man is brutish by his knowledge. Every founder is confounded by the graven image, for his molten image is falsehood. There is no breath in them. These idols, they are vanity. The work of errors in the time of their visitation, they shall perish. The portion of Jacob is not like them, for he is the former of all things, and Israel is the rod of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. God is the creator he is the sustainer of the earth, the world, of the heavens. Everything exists because of him. Now, let's get specific about this God. Is the Father God? That is pretty non-controversial with all these other isms that we've mentioned here. But we can look at 1 Corinthians 8, 6. It says, the Father created all things. 1 Peter 1, 1 says, God our Father. Very clear. Now here's where we get a little more controversial. The Son. What about the Son? Well, the Bible is quite clear that the Son is also this creator. The Son in John 1, 1 through 3 says this, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Without Him, there was nothing made that has been made. Okay, well, who is the Word? I had this, I met this guy out in front of Temple Square in downtown Salt Lake City back in 1994. And he said that he was a Mormon. He went on his mission in Australia. He found some Christians there that just gave him a rough time, really made him upset. And he would, he would argue with these Christians about the doctrine of God. He said these Christians made him so upset that he went home at night and he'd 
study up on his free time to come back and set these Christians straight. Well, he said that he ended up leaving his mission. He, he fulfilled his time on his mission. He returned back in honor. He went through BYU. He was living the Mormon life. And he came across this gas station in Idaho that had a little booklet by Billy Graham. You must be born again. He thought, oh, what the heck? He picked it up. He started reading it. At the end, Billy Graham invited, as his custom was, to start reading the Bible. And the first book of the Bible Billy Graham suggested reading was the Gospel of John. So Gene read this. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Without him, there was nothing made that has been made. And he thought, well, who's the Word anyway? Well, he gets down to verse 14 and it becomes quite obvious. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Obviously, a reference to none other than who? The Lord Jesus. So he took Jesus and he went back to verse 1 there and he stuck the term Jesus in place of the word and he read it again. In the beginning was Jesus and Jesus was with God and Jesus was God. Wait. Jesus was God. The same Jesus was in the beginning with God. Without Jesus, there was nothing made that has been made from the, from the beginning. He said, at that moment, the lights went on. And he said, Mormonism was gone. And as a, a note of encouragement to you, I'll say this. He said, these guys back in Australia will never know the impact they had on me because they were trying to pound this in my head, but I just wasn't getting it at the time, you see. So as a word of encouragement, when you deal with cults like I did on Thursday with these Jehovah Witnesses, and it looks like <laughs> nothing is getting through, and you feel like you're just banging your head up against the wall with these people. Remember that God has his timing. And it's not always your timing. And his word doesn't return void. It'll accomplish that what it's set out to do, Isaiah tells us. That's either going to save them or it's going to judge them someday. But our job is to get the word out there. One plants, one waters, but what? It's God who gives the increase. We trust him for that increase. You see. But anyway, this passage is very clear that Jesus is God from the beginning by which everything that exists is because of him. 1 Corinthians 8.6 Remember we mentioned that, that the Father created all things? It next says that by the Son, Jesus, were all things created. Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 through 18 says, Of the Son were all things created, whether they be in heaven or on earth, visible, invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers, all things are created by him and for him. And he is before all things. And by him, all things hold together. Very clear statements that Jesus as well as the Father are God. Now get this. The Holy Spirit is also referred to as God who created everything. 
Remember how we read uh, Isaiah 44, 24, that the Lord creates the heavens and the earth by himself. He does it alone. If that's the case, then in Genesis 1, verse 2, the Holy Spirit must be God because the Holy Spirit is moving upon the waters. The Spirit of God was moving upon the waters to form the heavens and the earth. The Holy Spirit is involved in creation. And in Acts chapter 5, verses 3 through 4, it says when Ananias and Sapphira were trying to trick the church with the money that was supposedly designated to the church. Was it the full amount? Oh, yeah. Well, they lied to the Holy Spirit. And then the next verse says, you lied to the Spirit, you lied to God. It's very clear in the Bible that the Holy Spirit is also God. Now, are they three gods? The Bible does not allow that. We have already established foundationally that there is only one God and he knows of no other God. Well, are the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit just different titles, different ways of appearing? Like, again, I'm a father, I'm a son, I'm a spirit, but I'm still one person. Is that what's going on? Well, the baptism of Jesus would say otherwise. Remember what happened at the baptism of Jesus? You didn't have just different names of one person going on there. Seems to me you have three distinct persons there. You have the Father's voice coming out of heaven. You have Jesus, the Son, being baptized. And you have what? The Holy Ghost descending in the bodily form of a dove. You have three distinct entities there, but they are inseparable because the Bible only allows there being one God. You also have John 1.1 1, 1 we just mentioned. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus was with someone else, and he was fully God just as the other person was fully God. You also have John 17 in Jesus' great high priestly prayer where he says, glorify them with the glory that I had with you before the foundation of the world. So it's very clear, you guys. The Trinity should maybe hard to wrap your head around, but if you stay within the parameters that there's only one God who creates everything, and this God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And they exist inseparably. They are not simply different terms to refer to one person. Then you should be able to keep this straight and present this to other people that have different definitions of God. All right? Do we have time for questions or should we? Okay. Okay. We'll re repeat the question if you have a question. Any questions? Okay. Dave. Wow, that's a can of worms. <laughs> the question is, what is my view on the chosen? Okay. The, everybody know what the chosen is? The chosen is a mini-series on 
the life of Jesus that came out by uh, LaHaye, uh, Tim LaHaye's son. What's his name? Dallas, uh, no, not LaHaye, Jenkins. That's it. So LaHaye, you know, they're with, they do the, yes, exactly. That's what I was thinking of. So Dallas Jenkins is the producer and uh, he is the main guy behind this miniseries on the life of Jesus. It is extremely well done. It tries to be faithful to what the Bible teaches. Now, Jenkins, the problem, so what's the problem? The problem is, is that Jenkins has come out and said that the Mormons have the same Jesus that we have as evangelicals. Obviously, I disagree with that. Now, Jenkins, Dallas is, is getting his sole information by what his friends have told him. And if you look at who is working with Jenkins and who is putting the money behind the Chosen and who is putting on these sets in Utah, actually, there's a set. Uh, in Goshen, that is where they film a lot of the Chosen, uh, you can see that the Mormons are really behind this. As a matter of fact, if you go to Utah, they have billboards on binge Jesus. Right? And you binge watch different things on Netflix, you understand? So with with The Chosen, you can binge Jesus by watching these series one right after another. And they have it on their BYU station. And so they are very supportive of The Chosen. And so Jenkins has come out and he said that he gets in dialogues with his Mormon friends and his Mormon from all that he is able to tell they believe in the same Jesus that we believe in. But he's quite emphatic about it. The problem is, is that it seems like he is sticking his head in the sand and doesn't want to hear what the church actually teaches about Jesus. Because the Jesus of the Mormon church is very clearly our elder brother in the pre-earth life, who wasn't always God from the beginning, the creator. Remember we were talking about that just a moment ago? That's not the Jesus of the Bible. Our, the Jesus of the Bible is not our elder brother in a pre-earth life. Because in DNC, 93, it's very clear that man was in the beginning with God and that the elements are eternal. So remember when we were talking about God being more of an organizer rather than a creator? This is official Mormon scripture and J Jenkins, Dallas, seems to be totally oblivious to this because he is getting his information simply from his friends. And let me tell you, the way Mormons talk, I'm going to be very upfront about this, is really demonic. Now, Mormons may not even know that they're doing this, but they have a certain way of talking. As a matter of fact, your own San Diego State residence literary scholar over here, Joanna Brooks, is a Mormon. And she has written this book that came out a couple years ago called Mormonism and White Supremacy. And she, in this book, she talks about an insider language that Mormons use and an outsider language that Mormons use. 
And she said the outsider language has been developed because of years of persecution and Mormons having to go underground because of polygamy. Hmm. And they were persecuted, and so Mormons began to curtail the way they spoke to make it more palatable for an outside audience. And Joanna Brooks, <laughs> God bless her, she just comes right out and says, calls it what Mormons have referred to it as, as lying for the Lord. So you understand with Dallas, if that is all his information is from, his friends, it could be it could be very much the case that these friends are lying intentionally or otherwise for the Lord to snow Dallas in getting him to think that. We believe in the same Jesus. Now, you guys have been inoculated. You know better. Okay. But you got to know what buttons to push to get all this stuff to come out of the Mormon's mouth. And Tara can affirm this for you. You can ask her because she grew up Mormon. This is the way Mormons talk. Okay. So. That's kind of my thoughts on Dallas. Yeah. D and C simply means doctrine and covenants. Yeah. Mormons have four books of scripture. They have the Bible and the King James Version. They have the Book of Mormon. They have the doctrine and covenants, the D and C. And they have the pearl of great price. Uh, very briefly, you know what the Bible touches, I'm assuming, okay? Yes. Now, the, the Mormons also have a Joseph Smith translation of the Bible, which is called the JST, or the Inspired Translation of the Bible. Remember we talked about the New World Translation for the Jehovah Witnesses? Mormons have the JST. But they don't use that so much as they use notes for that in their King James Version that they publish of the Bible. The Book of Mormon is a history of the ancient Israelites that came to the Americas to populate the Americas. And Jesus came to visit these ancient Native American Israelites, which were used to be primarily the Native Americans. They were the Native Americans. Now they're primarily the or a certain subgroup of the Native Americans because we can't find them anywhere. Doctrine and Covenants is a series of revelations given primarily through Joseph Smith. The Pearl of Great Price has the Book of Moses, which has a large section of Genesis in their JST, the Joseph Smith translation. And they also have the Book of Abraham, which is a papyri that Joseph Smith came across in 1835 that was supposedly these Egyptian hieroglyphics written by none other than Abraham himself. And so Joseph Smith began translating this, and lo and behold, we got it, this papyri today. And we know what the Egyptian says these days. And ain't, it ain't nothing like Joseph Smith wrote about. Joseph Smith was caught in a huge fraud here. So you have that. You also have a history of Joseph Smith's first vision and the early beginnings of the LDS church. And you also have a list of the 14 articles of faith. That is Mormon scripture. And with that, I think we better close it off here. We could pray and we'll be dismissed. Pray for the food too. Okay.
Father, Son, Holy Spirit, thank you for being with us today in dealing with a very heavy subject. I pray that you might help my brothers and sisters here to remember these things, that they might be able to use them when they come across other false teachers that want to lead them away from the truth. We thank you for this time. Lord, we thank you for the food. We pray that you might nourish it to our bodies, and we pray that you might bless our time of fellowship now. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. That's... Always good to hear you. Powerful. Thank you. Thank you, brother.